All righty. Welcome, everyone. We're going to give it just a few minutes while folks are getting settled in. Um, we also will be broadcasting this out on Facebook Live. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook, please note that our primary platform is Zoom. And therefore, um, all the Q&A and the chat function that our moderators um, will be holding throughout the session will be on that platform. However, if you are joining on us on Facebook, we're so excited to have you. And let's just give it a few more minutes while folks are trickling in and we'll get started. Okay, we have it as just after six, about 6.02. So I think we will go ahead and uh, get started with our event for this evening. Um, please note that your audio and visual will remain silent for the duration of the presentation to allow all attendees to view and hear our guest speakers. Um, I really want to join, uh, I really want to thank everyone for joining us today for today's Riverside Storytelling event virtually. Um, we have David Gessner and Hannah Henley here with us this evening, and we're just so thankful for their time. Um, we'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge that the community and the art of the Bluff Arts Festival is located on, their, on the traditional, ancestral, and modern day lands of the Hopi, Diné, Ute Mountain Ute, Ute, Rio Grande Pueblo people, and other traditional indigenous inhabitants of this land. We thank them for their stewardship of this land. We also wanted to take a moment before we uh, started to acknowledge the loss of a Bluff community member this week. Cindy Tume, owner of the Desert Rose Hotel, was a supporter of the arts and the arts festival. We offer our deepest condolences to her family during this difficult time, and she will be deeply missed by our entire community. Alrighty. Um, today's webinar is sponsored in part by Rocky Mountain Power, Community Real Build, Adventure Wealth, and Utah Canyon, Utah's Canyon Country. I would also like to thank our local businesses, hotels, restaurants for their continued support of the Bluff Arts Festival over the years. As we all know, this has been a very challenging year um, for many of us, but we are so thankful for the strong and compassionate community in which we call home. This is personally my favorite time of year. Uh, the weather is perfect for hiking and exploration. The cottonwood trees are turning yellow. The morning air is crisp, but out on the comb, it gets warm by midday. For our out-of-town guests, there are still plenty of great weather days left in the year, and, you, and we encourage you to come join us whenever you feel safe to do so. That could be next week. It could be next year. We're just excited to welcome you back. A big part of the artist's uh, or excuse me, of the Arts Festival is the Bluff Arts Artist Market. We have 30 artists who we're featuring this year, all of which you can find online. I have a few here um, as shown on the screen, uh, but you can find all of them on the Bluff Arts Festival website. Uh, we will be sharing this link for you momentarily in the chat box. This weekend, we also have a lot of really exciting additional events. Um, we have things scheduled for tomorrow, Friday, the whole way through Sunday, and we invite you to join us on Facebook Live or here on Zoom. Uh, please register for events if you'd like to attend them on Zoom at the Arts Festival website, www.bluffartsfestival.org. 
And as I said, we'll, you'll register to get your individual event, uh, event link. Um, I have a few additional housekeeping topics I'd like to go over before we get into the show this evening. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be sharing a link to the recording on our website and on our social media. We welcome you to revisit the content and also please share it with your friends and family. We also, while I know, um, well, I mentioned that your videos and microphones will stay silent throughout today's presentation, um, we really want to encourage engagement. Please feel free to use the Q&A box that you see on your screen if you think of any question you have for our speakers or our authors this evening, and our fantastic moderator, Zach, will pose it for our speakers during the discussion portion at the end of the reading. We also want you to use the chat function to connect with your fellow attendees. Say hi to your neighbors, and if you're an out-of-town guest, let us know where you're tuning in from this evening. We'd love to hear that. And now we will have um, a brief video from Mr. Jim Hook. He and his wife, Luann, have owned and operated Recapture Lodge for over 30 years. Uh, we're grateful for their continued support of the Bluff Arts Festival. Please enjoy this short film. And immediately following Jim's introduction, I will play a short four minute video to continue to get folks in the Bluff spirit. Welcome to Bluff, everyone. So it's fall. I just watched three deer come out on the beach across the way, and <clears throat> they're trotting their way across. Looks like they're going to Bill Davis's hayfield. Some stories could be told there. Well, a lone goose flying back to roost. You're not here, and I'm sorry about that. This is the weirdest year. <clears throat> Those deer are crossing, the goose just landed. But there's stories that we will have about this year that I'm not sure I want to hear for a while. We've got a great, these guys have done a great job putting the, the arts vessel together in a way I don't really understand. But I think it's going to be good. We just wanted to bring you down here and to our spot where we like to sit by the fire and listen to the stories. And we've had great stories here. Gene Fouché and uh, Melvin Gaines and lots of good music good writers and, and some great readings, and it, it's just a good place. The half mile walk to get here kind of sets your mind to where it should be. I hope you get to hear the river a little bit. Hope you get to enjoy this fall color that we're having in Bluff. And then I hope next year and the year after and the year after, we can all meet here again on the banks of the San Juan. So get ready for a, a good time, and we look forward to seeing you again. People uh, come through Bluff a lot to experience a wild place that has a lot of really interesting history and culture to it. People are starting to learn about the amazing things in Bluff's backyard. So we're seeing more and more people that aren't just passing through Bluff, um, but actually they're deciding to stay and make Bluff kind of a destination for their trip and see a lot of amazing things like River House on the San Juan River. My name is Nate Diazzi. I am a river guide for Wild Expeditions. We are on the San Juan River in southeastern Utah, one of the best places on the planet. You know, a lot of people can describe this as being out in the middle of nowhere, but when you start to really appreciate the landscape, you realize that it may be out in the middle of nowhere, but where else can you go to get high desert and see some awesome sandstone, canyon walls, the river? I mean, a lot of people are surprised when you tell them that the San Juan River is here, and so I think it really kind of puts things into perspective for them.
here at the Bears Edge Education Center, of course, we've got tons of maps we can show you around the area, give you some pointers on great places to see while you're on your trip. Um, but besides just good information about where to go and what to see, we help people understand what kind of things they can do to preserve these places. So the Education Center is meant to help equip people with the knowledge they need to be safe while they're out there and also visit in a way that doesn't damage these really sensitive cultural resources. We have quite a few people that have been visiting this area a lot longer than we have and they've left their mark. Uh, quite a few of them have been very artistic. They've left some drawings for us to appreciate. Uh, some folks interpret them to mean uh, certain things. Well, today we started off early this morning at Sand Island and got to float a beautiful stretch of the river. And you just get here and you can definitely just get this sense of wanting to respect such this amazing piece of history and it's really quite humbling. You have to see it and be in it to fully grasp the whole experience. My name is Russ Wheeler, the owner of Comeridge Eat and Drink here in beautiful Bluff, Utah. Now, our food isn't particularly complicated. You know, the idea is to have very accessible, very familiar food, but just make that really good, really local, really sustainable. You know, I think everyone comes here originally because of the location, and you know, it's just gorgeous, and there's so much to do. But then once you kind of get to know the people, there's a sense of sense of tight community that's really kind of seductive. That you know, I think because of the the remoteness and the smallness of the the town, that you know, everyone has to help each other out, and you get to know everybody. And I mean, it's just something that you don't get, you know, anywhere else in any other kind of community. You know, I really love Bluff. Um, a lot for what it's not, you know. It is not a big city. Um, it's not a place that has a lot of amenities. But what it has is probably the world's best backyard, especially if you're interested in history, you're interested in Native American culture, um, and uh, you like to have wild adventures without people telling you too much what to do. Well, we hopefully you enjoyed uh, those uh, few clips and little music to get us started. Um, at this time, I would like to hand the show over to author, award-winning journalist, film producer, and Bluff local, Mr. Zach Podmore. Zach, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks so much, Aaron, and thanks, uh, Jim, for that a uh, lovely intro video that took us down to the banks of the San Juan River where this event is uh, typically held. Um, the volunteers at the Bluff Arts Festival have done just such an incredible job this year uh, putting the uh, virtual version of the Bluff Arts Fest together um, and we're really honored to have with us tonight two uh, guests from um, outside of Bluff who are able to, to zoom in here and, and join us and share their uh, writing and, and research and experience in the area with us. Um, David Gessner, who will be speaking first, is uh, the first New York Times bestselling author who has cooked scrambled eggs in my kitchen at midnight. And as, a, uh, as an aspiring writer, I think that's an important milestone. Uh, so I thank David for, for that. Uh, David, I met him a couple years ago when he was uh, in the middle of working on the book that was just released a few weeks ago called Leave It As It Is, A Journey Through Theodore Roosevelt's American Wilderness. And I had the opportunity to read that book um, a few months ago or an early version of it. And it's a, a great journey that takes you uh, from uh, David's current home in North Carolina uh, through the history of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, early and middle and late life and connects uh, David's own you know, humor and insights to this piece of history that he very much makes alive in uh, bringing you know, 
Teddy Roosevelt and the Antiquities Act into the present moment and talking about what those things mean uh, in a place like Bluff and in a place like Bears Ears National Monument, uh, which is uh, definitely tied to that history. So I'm sure we'll hear more about that um, from him. And uh, also, um, he'll probably do a better job of, of plugging the book than I can, but uh, you should definitely check it out. Uh, it's, it's a great read. Um, he is also the author of 10 other books that blend, uh, I'll do a little bit more formal introduction here, uh, that blend a love of nature, humor, memoir, environmentalism, including Leave It As It Is, his most recent, and the best-selling All the Wild That Remains, Edward Abbey, Wallace Stegner, and the American West, which is also a great book. Um, in 2003, Gessner taught environmental writing as a Briggs Copeland lecturer at a place called Harvard. Uh, don't know where that is. It must be a university on the East Coast somewhere, but sounds impressive. Um, he now serves as the chair of the creative writing department at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where he is also the founder and editor in chief of the literary magazine Ecotone. His own prizes include a Pushcart Prize, a John Burroughs Award for Best Nature Essay, uh, the Association of Literature and the Environments Award for the Best Book of Creative Writing, and a Reed Award for the Best Book on the Southern Environment. In 2017, he hosted the National Geographic Explorer Show, uh, The Call of the Wild. So uh, thank you so much, David, for joining us tonight, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Zach. Um, I was tearing up a little during the bluff uh, video there. <laughs> the, the whole idea of this book, so much of it was born in bluff and thanks to Zach and Amanda for kind of hosting me and um, the book changed from what it originally was because of bluff really. And my plan was to come out there this summer and have that be my headquarters for promoting the book just as it was my headquarters for writing the book. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, but, you know, early on, um, I was writing about Teddy Roosevelt, but I was really writing about the Antiquities Act. In 1906, this act was created where a president could declare land without Congress, you know, just declare it straight up. And of course, um, you know, Barack Obama in 2016, December, declared Bears Ears, and a lot of people locally there were involved in helping um, that uh, happen. Um, and I was lucky enough to be pointed by some people there, including Zach, Amanda, um, and others, toward Regina Lopez White Skunk, who was my first person I interviewed and perhaps the most important, and it changed the course of the book. And, you know, I was the token Easterner in Red Rock Stories, the little book that came out and it was distributed to Congress by Tory House Press. And I was so thrilled when, uh, when Bears Ears was created. And it was like a pro wrestling body slam. We were lifted up and then 10 months later, on October 27th, which not incidentally was Theodore Roosevelt's, would have been his 159th birthday, with Ryan Zinke standing in front of a portrait of Roosevelt and claiming he was a Roosevelt Republican, Bears Ears, 85% of it was undeclared. And this was a historic thing. There had only been one other incident of this in the history of the, of the um, Antiquities Act and National Monument. And in fact, the Antiquities Act right now isn't getting a lot of press because things like that minor other show going on right now, the town halls are, are happening, uh, but it's still lingering in a District of Columbia courthouse. And really what they're deciding is this question of whether one president can undeclare, unsave land that a previous president has saved? A huge question. If, if it is decided one way, if it worked its way up to the Supreme Court perhaps, it would mean nothing was ever truly saved. And as environmentalists know, nothing really is ever truly saved except with vigilance. Um, anyway, I wanna not forget to thank Greg Lehman, uh, Lewis, who helped me get up San Juan Hill, Vaughn, um, and Peter Walker, whose house I stayed in while I was in Bluff. That was a pretty sweet headquarters to have. Um, 
and I want to thank him in part because I want him to give me that house again when I come back next year to do the, the arts festival. Um, I've been talking a lot at these things. My wife, who's a novelist, says people don't like to be read to because they've been trained from when they were a kid to go to sleep when they're read to. But I promised I would read tonight. Um, so don't go to sleep. Um, and I'll keep these little tidbits short and they're all, they all have a bluff angle. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I've been talking about in my book is the Antiquities Act and Roosevelt. And Roosevelt, his daughter said of him, Alice Roosevelt said, he wanted to be the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the baby at every christening. And like Trump, he was kind of this magnet for attention. So it's been kind of a bizarre world where while this book has come out, he's still getting attention. You know, Trump is calling it Yosemite or Yosemite. Um, his statue is coming down in front of the Museum of Natural History. Trump is claiming to be equal to Roosevelt as a conservationist, ha ha ha. Um, and just this Monday when I was reading in virtual Portland uh, on the day of, um, the day of uh, Indigenous People Day of Rage, I guess it was called, Roosevelt statue went down, so um, came down. And so it's been interesting to me because one of the things I try to do in the book, which I'll read about, is create a kind of confluence between this old ideal, which we, you know, Wallace Stegner used to call America's best ideal, idea, and say, well, okay, it's a good idea, but what's wrong with it? And obviously one thing is taking native land away, indigenous land away. And there are other things wrong with it, the park as island. So the idea of the book was how to take this old ideal and make it even better and make it more inclusive, larger, um, more fit for the times and, and fighting the climate battle. But here I am talking again, can't stop myself. And I promised I'd read, so I'm gonna read a little bit. Um, this section is from uh, the Bears Ears celebration in the summer of um, 2018, which was at the meadow below the Bears Ears. And it's just a little, a little bit that I, a little story that I heard that I thought was really fascinating. A highlight of the celebration was speaking with Mark Merriboy, who in eight, 1986 became Utah's first Native American county commissioner. This wasn't his first first. 10 years before, he had graduated from the University of Utah after being, along with his brother, the first two reservation kids to attend and graduate from public school in San Juan County. And I'm sorry, it wasn't Bluff. That school was in Blanding. Mary Boy put the lie to one of the stereotypes being perpetuated by those who opposed the original map of Bears Ears and supported the current reduction. The stereotype is that the decision to create Bears Ears as a monument was rash, fast, thoughtless. It is obvious to anyone who takes more than a few minutes to look into the issue that long study was a crucial aspect of the monument's creation. But what Mark Mary Boy made clear to me is that Bears Ears has been a Native American priority for much longer than that. He told a story of being a kid in the 60s on the reservation and having his parents say, Mark, you have to come hear this man speak tonight. The man was Bobby Kennedy, who was running for president and who was visiting the reservation. That night, Kennedy asked the elders on the reservation what their priorities were and how the federal government could help. And Mark remembers what the elders said to Bobby Kennedy. You need to protect the bear's ears. So that was just one of the little moments up there um, that just cumulatively kind of blew me away. And, um, and it was really thrilling to be up there. Even the part of kind of being, of people who are up there remember kind of being under assault from <laughs> the local ranchers who'd moved the signs. And um, there, was a, there was a kind of, uh, positive energy, slightly warlike, but positive energy. And speaking of slightly warlike, um, one of the things I do, I don't want to be, I know it's not a night to be overtly political, except on the other channels, um, but Donald Trump does factor into this book. Um, at one point, I have a hypothetical fight between him and Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt had done jujitsu and, and was a boxer. Uh, Trump had the advantage on sheer mass, but I kind of 
play out them in, in, in a battle. Um, but I, I try not to be, you know, blatantly and overtly political kind of in the style of our times. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with the book, which really started that day where the where Bears Ears was undeclared, was take a long, thoughtful look at what was going on in the country. I had a lot of writer friends who were doing kind of knee jerk next day, um, writing articles about what Trump had said the day before. And I wanted to try to go a little deeper. Um, Roosevelt, of course, and I, I, I lay out his flaws in the book too, particularly in terms of his attitude toward Native Americans, but there was something he did do. There were thing, many things he did do that you know, kind of made me half fall in love with him at the same time I was um, not so fond of him. And I didn't feel like it was my job to be an amateur St. Peter and consign him to heaven or hell. I just wanted to kind of re-explore uh, the possibilities of the person and see what I could put to use in my life as a activist, minor activist and, and writer. So this is from Walking Along uh, Comb Ridge. I knew Ro Roosevelt had something direct and relevant to say to our times. Something that might surprise though, those who saw him merely as a fighter. In his essay, Longitude and Latitude Among Reformers, he described his route through the political world as similar to hiking along the top of a ridge, not unlike the one I now found myself walking every morning. On either side of the metaphoric ridge were two things he disliked equally. On the one side, he despised the merely successful. He would be disturbed to see the way this shallow valuation has continued and grown, our national glorification of results, whatever the means. Commercialism for its own sake was despicable to him and the power that corporations and the rich had appalled him. But the other side of the ridge was equally unappealing. This was the domain of the dogmatists. It was here that he encountered extreme do-gooders and pushers of causes who ultimately harmed those causes because their minds would not open to any vision but their own. His dislike of the first side was idealistic. His dislike of the second, practical. You could say that one was what he disliked about the political right, the other about the left. The one pushed him towards supporting issues like economic justice. The other helped him get things done. Efficiency for selfish gain was an evil. Efficiency toward a greater good was admirable. But for all his dislike of impractical reformers, he saved his greatest wrath for those who were ambitious without morals. He wrote, take this as you will, this quote, success is abhorrent if attained by the sacrifice of the fundamental principles of morality. The successful man, whether in business or politics, who has risen by consciousless swindling of his neighbors, by deceit and chicanery, by unscrupulous boldness and unscrupulous cunning, stands toward society as a dangerous wild beast. Um, so um, that's going on in the book too. Um, lots of threads. I, I started with the Abby Stegner book a few years to kind of challenge myself to, to work on multiple levels, um, to you know, have a biographical thread, a travel thread, and an environmental kind of state of the environment um, thread. Um, I'm not gonna read, um, I, I, I asked Amanda permission to read what she said about Ryan Zinke, uh, but I see time's a little short, so I'm gonna paraphrase it instead, Amanda. Um, and somebody can jump, me, jump in on the chat and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Friends of Cedar Mesa was the only environmental group that uh, Ryan Zinke met with during his listening tour, which was theoretically going to decide the fate of Bears ears, so some felt uh, you know, the, the, the fix was in. And Amanda said that the day before she was going to be part of a group hiking with Zinke, an older member of the group, uh, I hope he's not listening and hears himself called older, but a gentleman said, you know what, this is speaking to Amanda, you're the most important person in the room tomorrow when you meet him, because you're the only person in the room who's not an old white male. And that gave me the sort of courage I needed to face Zinke. Sure enough, 
when we got in the room the next day, he looked at me like, what are you doing here, small young woman? Still, we were hopeful we could have a truly adult to adult professional engagement. And they, they gave, um, Amanda and the, the group gave them, gave Zinke all the preparations they've done, all the work they've done. Um, the group from Friends of Cedar Mesa tried to make their argument that Zinke had effectively taken the steam out of the room. He barely listened. Um, what he did was talk about how he was gonna reorganize the uh, Department of the Interior and just dismissed what they said by saying, I'm a facts guy. I only go with the facts. I don't go with estimates. So anyway, this carries on and Amanda's telling me this story, and this was my favorite part that, I'm, that I am going to quote. Since Zinke's early environmental track record as a congressman in Montana had not been all bad, Amanda wondered whether he had secret environmentalist leanings. Was he simply drinking the Trump Kool-Aid? Afterwards, he concluded, he's not just drinking the Kool-Aid, he is mixing, making, and stirring it. Before we finished our coffee, Amanda told me that on the way home from their meeting, still fuming, she created a cocktail she called the Zinke Screwdriver. A lot of vodka mixed with swagger and bravado, poured over crushed dreams with a splash of douchebag and a twist of bullshit. Um, anyway, I go on to talk a little bit about how Zinke kept calling himself a Roosevelt Republican and really not to be, I mean, I'm critical enough of Zinke in there, but to say, Everybody loves covering themselves in Roosevelt. It's funny, the right and the left. And one of the things this book has tried to do is kind of Trojan horse into more uh, right, you know, more conservative groups because they like Roosevelt. And I do feel like one of the only areas where we ha still have overlap is the land. Um, though in your neck of the woods, some of the battles are so fierce over just that, but there are little glimmers of hope around the country despite the overall hopeless time. Let me just ask rather than, um, rather than, I was gonna read the little part about being up top bears ears, but Zach, should I cut it short here and, and let some Q and A's come in? Are we, are we running behind? Well, we don't have any questions yet. So I just uh, feel free to type your questions for David into the chat while he reads that final section. And yeah, I think we're good on time, so. Okay, I'll just read this and then um, then we can do what we will. And I've been drinking water because I want to be able to pronounce things, but now that I'm in the home stretch, I think I'm going to shift over to more my natural habitat here and have a little beer. This is during my initial trip to Bears Ears. Um, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about a possible confluence between what was going on here and you know what had gone on 120 years before when land was starting to be saved. And I kind of started to see what happened then as a rough draft with flaws and troubles, but a rough draft that we could use now. And when I talked to Regina, um, that's kind of what she said. She said, we're not trying to kind of um, say, this is our land, we want it back. We're trying to use the tools that were used then for a new purpose. All right, so I'll read this, make it through, and then hopefully chat with you a little bit. Um, we're on our way up to Bears Ears, uh, Greg Lehman and I. We got back in the car and headed up a snowy dirt road closer and closer to the Bears Ears. We passed on a single individual or car. We parked below the Western Butte and began a snowy, treacherous climb to the base. My heart was thundering in my chest, and my bad knee was aching, and Greg didn't seem to be moving much faster than I was. But we worked our way up, slipping and sliding, our boots clumped with red dirt and snow. It wasn't until we were at the base in the shade of the Western Butte that we realized that this was the first time in an hour that we didn't have a view of both ears. We settled in. Greg rolled a cigarette, and I pulled two beers from my pack. We toasted, celebrating our ascension. Is this sacrilege, I asked him, nodding toward the beer. Possibly, he answered. But if Greg was aware of the sacredness of this place, he was also on familiar terms with the profane. 
My grandfather worked not far from here in a uranium mine, he told me. We leaned back against the Butte's hard base and took it all in. If one were to consider the misdeeds of the man who is currently president and rank them in a tournament of malfeasance, few would give the reduction of bear's ears a top seed. With children being separated from their parents, coercion of foreign governments for personal gain, and seeming support for white supremacist groups, and all the rest of the coarseness that goes with the daily Trump show, it might not be seen, it, not might, it might not seem that saving some arid land in Utah should get people too excited. But I would contend that this is because most of us do not understand that Bears Ears is not just about the potential destruction of the land, but about the destruction of an ideal, or rather the destruction of a new confluence of ideals. If the newspaper headlines were any indication, this place was the center of the world, but it sure felt empty. Later, Greg and I would hike in and explore just the sort of ancient sites that the Antiquities Act was created to protect, and ones that thankfully would remain within the redrawn maps. But for the moment, we were content to sit and stare out at the vastness. Maybe it was the beer or the exertion, but for the moment, I was focused less on the politics of the fight than on the sheer quiet beauty of the place. It would be hard to call this a hopeful time in our national history, but I believed and still believe that wild, beautiful land is the greatest thing about our country. It is the single best reason for hope, not small and quibbling human plans and contretemps, but the land, a physical statement of our belief in the future. With so many other pressing issues, it might seem like fighting for an empty place in the middle of nowhere does not qualify as a burning priority, but it does for Greg, for Regina Lopez White Skunk, and for many of us. For the five tribes that formed the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, and came up with the plan for the monument. This is a place of origin, of stories, of history, of culture. For many others, Anglos like me included, it is a place of beauty, a place to connect to the natural world. But it is also more than that, I thought as I sat in the shadow of one butte and stared at the other. It is about a dream of the confluence of ideals, a flowing together of native respect for the land with the ideals however sometimes flawed in practice that created the national parks and national monuments and preserved other public lands. It is about belief itself, the notion that there are still things worth fighting for, large and great and hard to express things in a world grown crass and petty and small. Thanks. That was a little more political than I planned it to be. Sorry, Zach. <laughs> Oh, that was beautiful, and uh, thank you for that. And um, we have one question in the chat from Trent in North Carolina. What has been the most interesting thing you have learned about yourself as a writer and traveler in all your experiences? Wow, I went all the way to Bluff and I'm getting a question from North Carolina, what the hell? Um, learned about myself. I don't know, like most writers, I'm kind of a sociopath and that I'm able to both experience reality and be like a reality show onto myself, like, and write about it at the same time. And that even includes when emotional things are happening in my life. Like my first book was about my dad's death, which I felt in a very raw way, but I was also at night scribbling in my journal. In fact, he was in a morphine haze as, you know, on his hospice bed, and he saw me scribbling and he said, make sure you get the facts down. It was like the first kind of sane thing he'd said in days. So he was aware of that. And I think oddly, Roosevelt, you know, who was obviously president, was a naturalist, was an explorer, um, all these other things, also wrote 47 books. You know, how did he do that? It was some kind of, and he read at one point like a book a night and said, reading is like a disease for me. So, you know, it's this weird kind of fragmentation of a writer's life where you want to experience things, but you also um, want to kind of chronicle them at the same time. All right, we'll do one more because we have one more already in there. 
from North Carolina? Or? I don't know where this one is from. It's from Mary. And she says, were you able to present for Sally Jewell's listening session in Bluff, which I think was in 2016? Uh, when yeah, Sally I was a little behind the curve on that one. I think you guys were there for that. And a lot of what I did was try to talk to people, you know, and, and recreate. But um, it just, it was fascinating to me how your town, like so much happened there. It was, like I said in the piece I read, it was, you know, it feels like, out, out in the middle of nowhere, but it was also the center of the world at that time. And when I was traveling around, you know, staying at your house and going down to the Grand Canyon, every day it seemed like there was a piece in the New York Times, you know, about Bears Ears or, the, or resource use. And so it was interesting. And I'd really like to get, you know, when I was there, I kind of um, had a little real estate lust, which I'm probably the nightmare of many buff people like the Easterner coming in, but um, uh, I'd really like to spend more time out there and, and had planned on spending a lot of time out there in your trailer, of course, this summer, but <laughs> I wasn't able to. So. All right, we've got one more easy one. Oh, maybe it's easy, I don't know. When you're writing a book, how much time do you spend each day writing? It is pretty easy for me. You know, I'm a writing teacher too. And I, I'm, I get continually frustrated by these grad students who come from all over the country to study and who write occasionally. Um, I think dailiness in writing, like so many things, you know, if you were a pro athlete, you wouldn't practice occasionally. If you're a pro writer, you know, you write daily. And for me, it's early in the morning, just because no one else is around. And, you know, my habits are pretty ingrained. I, you know, I get up, I feed the dogs, feed the cat, drink the coffee, stretch the back, and then I'm at it. And for, so for about a regular day, it's three or four hours before the rest of the day starts. You know, and then you got to wait 21 hours until you write again. And for me, writing is often one of the highlights of the day because I love the way you're engaged in problem solving when you're, you're writing. Um, so much of it, you know, it's like kind of carpentry you're like, how do I figure, how do I figure this out? So, Great. Well, Zach, you've got a question in Q and A's as well. Oh, all right. Do we have time <laughs> for one more, Aaron? And then I'll get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's from Lewis Williams, who is a uh, character in the book. Yes, he is. And a real a person. dashing, handsome oh. character in the book, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you think Roosevelt's stance, what do you think Roosevelt's stance would be if he was presently here and was asked about the implementation of Bears Ears Monument? Well, I've been thinking a lot about this one. It's a great question, Lewis, and, um, and I would like to go down the river with you <laughs> if I ever get out there. Um, but the one, you know, the, the, the things that I really lay bare are obviously his attitude toward Native people but there's another thing that happens late in his life where he's got this kind of, where he's been accused of this eugenics thing that was really um, quite in the air, unfortunately, uh, in pre-World War II uh, America. And I believe, and I'm not trying to defend the guy, I, I mean, uh, I guess I am defending him, but I'm saying I believe that he, as a reader, a thinker, a scientist, um, he was open to new ideas. And if you flip him on the other side of World War II, um, he was already, before World War I, up, uh, down on Germans for, for their racism. And if you flip him on the other side, um, I think we would have, you know, essentially he was the strongest advocate for conservation we've ever had in the Oval Office and the only one who made it one of the top three priorities while he was in the Oval Office. And I think he'd be able to articulate the climate fight, I think he'd be, of course, saving bears ears in other places. And, uh, you know, we'd want, we want somebody a little less brutal than Roosevelt in there, but we want somebody who, who fights the fight. And we haven't had anybody in a long time. So um, I don't know if, it, oh, you said the other one was easy question. This is one that I could go on for hours, but we don't have hours and I'll, 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 I'll clear out, so. 
Oh, well, thanks again for joining us, David. That was great. And uh, there's 50 people in the Zoom, I see, and more on Facebook. So great turnout. Uh, everyone check out the book. It's called Leave It As It Is. And here's Amanda with uh, My another own cocktail. character. The book. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Amanda. Here, you're going to clink with me. Joining us. <laughs> so, thank you. I'm looking forward to next year and being being there on the San Juan, definitely. That'd be great. I look forward to your visit. Um, another, for those of you that joined at the very beginning of the presentation and caught Jim Hook's uh, introduction video down at the uh, the San Juan River, um, that's where the storytelling event that we're replicating tonight is usually held. And um, for the last several years, we've um, had a tradition of hosting the winner of that year's Ellen Malloy Fund Award for Desert Writers. Um, if anyone doesn't know who Ellen Malloy is, um, get out a scrap of paper and write that name down uh, right away. She's uh, one of the best writers and essayists uh, who um, ever worked in the American Southwest, in my opinion. Um, she's a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and also a uh, a resident of Bluff, um, and she um, died suddenly in 2004, but left us with uh, four uh, amazing books um, that I don't think get nearly enough attention. Uh, but one of the uh, the legacies of Ellen Malloy in Bluff is uh, family and friends who have set up this award fund called the Ellen Malloy Fund for Desert Writers. Uh, that's able to give a grant to a writer working on a desert project, um, a nature writing project typically, uh, or a science writing project. Um, and down at that storytelling event at the river, uh, we've had uh, the, the, that year's winner. Uh, so we're able to do that again tonight with Hannah Hindley, who is this year's winner for the Ellen Malloy Fund. And uh, Hannah, feel free to jump in with uh, anything else you'd like to add about uh, Ellen Bloy um, in addition to your presentation, if, if you would like to do that. Um, Hannah has spent the last three decades working as a naturalist and wilderness guide in remote wild places um, from the arid islands of the Sea of Cortez and the fog of, the, of Baja, California to national parks all over the West. She has written for publications including Harvard Review, uh, Terrain, River Teeth, and Alaska Magazine. Hannah is the recipient of the Thomas Wood Award in Journalism, the New Conrad's Prize, the Bill Waller Award for Nonfiction, and this year's recipient of both the Watterson Desert Writing Prize and the Ellen Malloy Desert, Desert Writers Award. Uh, she recently earned her MFA in Creative Nonfiction from the University of Arizona. Her current book project, Thin Blue Dream, is part ghost story, part natural history, and part adventure narrative. It explores the desert southwest disappearing waterways, the fish that used uh, to the fish that used to call them home, and the successes and complications that come with efforts to restore depleted tributaries with treated city wastewater. So we're very grateful for uh, Hannah joining us tonight. And uh, again, as we uh, we're able to do it, David. Feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box or into the chat, and um, we'll turn those over to her after we hear a little bit more about Thin Blue Dream. So thanks, Hannah. Thank you so much, Zach. <laughs> Sorry, I gave you a mouthful there. I also realized that I'm doing this wrong and I don't have a cocktail poured. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll do it. I'll do it better next time, maybe in person. Um, but I'm honored to be here virtually, um, although I really wish I were on the banks of the San Juan right now. Um, also really honored to be in the company of David Gessner, um, and of course, really honored to be this year's uh, Ellen Malloy Award recipient, uh, who um, as a desert writer and adventurer has been a guiding light for me. Um, I think my writing has been very much influenced by actually both Ellen Malloy and Colin Malloy. Uh, so this award feels uh, like a fun um, full circle. Um, and because we're virtual tonight, uh, I'm gonna take some liberties and take you all on a field trip to a couple of different desert river systems other than the San Juan. Uh, so I'll be sharing a couple 
different sections from my current project, um, which as Zach was saying is an exploration mostly of effluent rivers in the de desert southwest, which means rivers that only flow because we flush our toilets and shower, uh, which makes them uh, really beautiful ecosystems and also really complicated ones. Um, and this particular project started in Arizona, but um, I'll be expanding my research and heading to Utah tomorrow. So I look forward to being a little closer to bluff in real life pretty soon. Uh, so I'll share a couple of those different sections with folks. Um, I go walking with a friend up the Santa Cruz River this morning, shoes undone and laced across our shoulders. We slosh our feet in the green ooze here where water is running its fingers down the spine of the long, dry riverbed. Water doesn't flow here often, although it used to, back when the Hohokam irrigated their crops in this valley a thousand years before Christ, and later when Spanish horsemen arrived in their dusty saddles in the 17th century with their fruit and their cattle and their magpie eyes for buried silver, and their blueprints for missions, which rose up out of the desert soil like flowers along a vine. By the mid 20th century, the river was mostly gone, slurped up by groundwater pumping and hungry cattle and pecan groves and urban expansion. When I first moved to Tucson, the river showed up blue on my Google Maps screen, but I arrived at the banks expecting water and instead found a brown wash tangled with torn bushes and orphaned shopping carts and the dry flutter of grocery bags left behind by the last flood. Last spring, though, the city of Tucson elected to replenish the river with treated wastewater so that the river might bloom again with Palo Verde and mesquite trees so that the pig-like javelinas might kneel at the banks to sit so that the water from our bathtubs and toilets and sinks might percolate slowly down through the gravel and loam to replenish the thirsty aquifer under I-10. It was a success. Already endangered fish had returned to the wet stretches of river and mesquite seedlings and dragonflies with bodies like ruby and honey and amber. My friend and I go wading, celebrating the new water letting our toes sink into the warm slick of algae. We are talking idly about love, Clara and I, but I am thinking about Hans Christian Andersen as we splash upstream. I'm thinking about the hardbound copy of his fairy tales that my mother keeps on her shelf in her upstairs bedroom in California, the one that she grabbed, not her passport, not her medications, when she evacuated our burning hometown last year. The book is precious to her, each story a piece of her Pennsylvania childhood, the firefly twinkling backyard, the nights spent curled between my grandparents as they read aloud. I am thinking about the story my mother read to me from that same tattered book when I was small, about a mirror made by a wicked sprite about how that mirror breaks into a hundred thousand pieces and goes wafting around the world, poisoning the way that people see things. In the story, one of these invisible splinters blows into the heart of a little boy and roses grow ugly to him and he speaks hatefully to his little friend and he disappears into Lapland with a cruel and beautiful snow queen who whisks him away to her gem-like palace in the north his friend travels in search of him. She speaks to the river and to the flowers and walks under thin northern trees, their branches heavy with winter snow, until she finds her friend, until she melts the little splinter in his chest. I am thinking about the Snow Queen because a while ago I visited an underground laboratory on the university campus where I teach. I passed through a tall windowed lobby and traveled down a staircase into a hallway that gleamed with grayish linoleum. The door to the lab had a black and white cautionary printout taped to it that read, warning, giant water bugs on duty. Inside, a dark haired graduate student named Drew showed me his workstation, 
the metallic countertops, the pickled water bugs, a botanical map of the Sonoran Desert pinned to the wall. He knew the water in the Santa Cruz River was clean. It was tested regularly. The water was, within reason, free from E. coli, from heavy metals. But Drew was interested in the invisible things, the things that evade testing. I am thinking about the Snow Queen, because in Drew's world, and in mine, those fairy tale mirror splinters aren't made of glass, aren't enchanted. They look like threads and orbs and shards, pink and blue and foggy white. They're made of plastic, tiny, and blown about the world like fractured glass. They peel away from fleece jackets and settle in the street dust in Tehran. They spill like little marbles out of factories and throng down current in the Rhine and pulse apart into smaller and smaller fragments in wide ocean currents and in wintry Lapland woods under heavy branched trees, they wisp groundward with the fresh fallen snow. They settle into stomach linings and the pink cave walls of lungs. They nestle in the bellies of fish and in the reproductive tracts of people. They choke and sterilize and turn the world ugly. And for a hundred thousand years, a single unseen plastic shard might travel and re-travel its slow ecosystem loop through gill and uterus, mushroom and shark and table salt. In his laboratory, Drew tweezed mosquito fish out of their alcohol baths. Their bodies were gray and pale, little armored mummies pulled from eddies along the banks of the Santa Cruz River. Drew laid them under the microscope and opened their bodies like the pages of a book. He snapped them open, set aside their heads, their tails, pulled open their bodies still wet with clean, clean river water. Drew rummaged through their bellies and under the microscope, we found them, scarcely visible, lodged deep, little indestructible fibers, cold and blue as gems. And I'll read uh, another section uh, which circles around to and back away from uh, the Santa Cruz River again. Eventually there'll be a bluff section in this book, perhaps. A fish in the hand is like a half remembered word on the tongue, buttery, evasive. It edges away from your scooping palm, feeling you before you arrive, si sliding sidelong like a gull with a cracker, not wishing to draw attention to itself. When your fingers close around it, it still somehow slips loose like one of those ungraspable toy store tubes filled with water and beads. Finally, you manage to lift it above the water, above the net, squeezing it gently between your palms, upper edge, and the thick of your thumb. It's maybe three inches long, and you can just make out the hair-like indentation that runs lengthwise along its side, the lateral line that gives the fish its sixth sense that lets it feel the water displaced by your hand long before skin meets scale, that allows it to follow its prey's vortices through the cool shadows under the bank. Under its skin, the fish has a thin band of red muscle. This powers its quotidian swimming, but wrapped around its core are fat slabs of white muscle, the emergency gears. In a moment, the entire fish can galvanize, one thick fist of muscle punching outward and away. The fish's body is mostly made out of potential energy, quiet white muscle waiting for disaster. This is what lets it slip through your fingers like jelly. This is what keeps it from being netted at all. Around you, among the pebbles under your soles, in the deeper cutaways where your net couldn't scrape, are a dozen other uncatchable fish. How I ended up in a canyon four hours north of Tucson with fish between my fingers has equal parts to do with curiosity and disbelief. 
I moved to Tucson in the late summer after the monsoon rains had mostly subsided, but months before the desert heat would abate. The sun felt vertical and aggressive. The plants, cactus, yucca with saw teeth, drew blood. Weird bugs gathered around my porch light and the cracked pavement radiated heat even at night. The rivers in town were dry washes, just memories of water that might have flowed there decades ago in a gentler climate. One evening, sipping beer with a friend in her living room, I saw the paintings, watercolor fish swimming on the wall above the couch. I asked her about them. My boyfriend painted them, she said. He studies fish here. Here in Tucson, I asked, incredulous. Yeah, she said. In fact, I'm pretty sure there are endangered fish living right here in the city. I looked it up when I got home. Sure enough, there it was in the headlines from 2016. Endangered fish returns to Santa Cruz River near Tucson. I tried to overlay this vision of moving water, of wild fish, across what I knew of Tucson. It's flat sprawl, it's dry streets glittering with broken glass, it's hot and empty riverbeds. I was captivated by the story, by its unlikeliness, by the hope embedded in it. Read all about it. Hostile place supports life. I wrote to Peter Rainthal, an ichthyologist at the University of Arizona. I wanted to see his records. Together, we scrolled through old sightings and surveys. The first Gila top minnow was identified in the late 1800s along the banks of the Santa Cruz River here in Tucson. The last one was collected in the 1940s. 70 years went by before this little top minnow, assumed to be gone from Tucson forever, returned. It's what we do, Peter explained to me as we pulled down jars of fish from the shelves of the university's collection. We run long-term surveys so that we can keep track of changes in population. Things might disappear, he explained to me, but they also might return. He handed me a jar from decades ago, its label yellowy and etched in tiny print, little fishes curled inside like bookmarks. Peter is in charge of conducting Arizona's longest continuously running fish survey. Twice a year, he brings a handful of undergraduate students to Aravaipa Canyon and in concert with the US Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy, wades down 11 miles of the creek in search of native fish. He invited me along. The day of the survey, I rattled down a dirt road alongside seven biology students in the back of a once white pickup truck, ducking to avoid trailing vines. When we hopped out of the truck, a hazy glitter puffed up from our footfall. Silt and mica and other dusts rubbed loose by moving water. The canyon was just waking up. Birds said their morning things from somewhere inside the green tangle of trees that lined the creek. On either side, the canyon walls, pink, bruised dark, yellow, gathered close like escorts. We stepped single file into the creek. Cold water oozed inside our neoprene socks and warmed slowly as we walked. We moved quietly, although we didn't need to. A survey isn't easy work. In Aravaipa, two people handled a net connecting two wooden staffs. They tilted it and plunged it forward as they splashed downstream on either side of the creek, stretching the net perpendicular across the width of the water. Lead weights at the bottom of the net kept its leading edge close to the stream bed, flushing fish upward into the weave. The end of a run took skill. Leave the bottom of the net too low for too long and the fish will continue downstream. One netter ran ahead, brought the net parallel to the bank, and together, the netters stepped back from each other and pulled the material taut. Bucket, a netter shouted, and surveyors came with sloshing buckets to scoop fish up with their hands and into their pails. As they identified the fish in the net, they shouted to Peter, who stood choreographing the affair and keeping tally on a weatherproof clipboard. One juvenile sucker, loach minnow, two spike. I liked the spike days, especially. Imagine a handheld fan made of tissue paper, diaphanous material webbed between straight staves. These are the fins of the spike dace, gossamer skin pulled between fin rays, which, like fans, like finger bones, can spread wide and fold closed. 
A spike dace has one strong, sharp ray on the leading edge of its dorsal fin. I chased the fish around the net where they wiggled and bent, grasped them with my fingers, closed around my palm. I used my thumb to feel for their spike. Our buckets filled with spike dace, 17 at one site, 42 at another, 76 in one exceptionally spike dacey stretch of the stream. Spike dace, spike dace, spike dace, called the netters. I grew to love them. They were abundant, recognizable, easy to tally. I did not learn until later in the day that most spike dace in Arizona have disappeared, maybe more than 80% of them. Where we are today is among the final streams where spike dace still haunt the riffles. Arizona is inhabited by the ghosts of waterways that once were, is haunted by the shadows of fish that have slipped through the fingers of time. Oops. Those are a couple of glimpses into the project. I'm happy to read more if there aren't questions or happy to answer questions if there are. Well, thank you so much for that. That was beautiful. I don't see any <laughs> questions yet. Um, so I don't know. I feel like we're getting a, a sneak preview of the audio book here. And uh, yeah. <laughs> your, um, I don't know, almost choreographed reading voice. It's so good. I'd love to hear a little bit more if, uh, and give people time to. Of course. Yeah. Um, questions come in. Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, we'll jump forward through stories that you'll have to read the book to, to hear. Um, but I'll read maybe just one more section, um, a shorter one here. Uh, I think about that river long after I peel off my waders and return home for a quick shower, a shower that will feed the river a few blocks down from where I live on the west side of Tucson. As the water beads on my shoulders and slaps underfoot, I think about the dying fish in their shrinking pool and about the blue plastic shards under Drew's microscope and about the untraceable underground water welling up into Arizona's few remaining wild streams like Aravaipa, and about the river that will soon only run through Flagstaff via pipes rather than channels, and about the endangered top minnows that later will be gently pulled from their formalin baths and counted and celebrated in some lab on the university campus. I'd like to tell you that resilience is possible I'd also like to tell you that it's complicated, that the water might not be as clean or as enduring as we might hope. I'd like to tell you that whatever responsibilities we have, whatever we might owe these endangered fish, now that we've resurrected them, might be larger than the attention span of city governments. That in this drying region where aquifers are slinking deeper and deeper underground, aquifers that scientists estimate could take thousands of years to refill to their, formal level, their former levels, where average rainfall is shrinking in an already dry state, where urban population continues to grow, where water is diverted from a dwindling Colorado River across hundreds of miles of angular cement diversion canals. When the time comes to make tough water choices, the fish likely aren't going to get first dibs. After water supplies are cut for ranchers and businesses and private homes, the last folks that get supreme water rights above the rest of Arizona are the farmers in Yuma, the ones who grow 90% of the nation's winter supply of leafy greens. The top minnows might not stand a chance. I'd like to tell you also that they're beautiful places, these effluent rivers, these ephemeral channels where we've settled into a uniquely 21st century eco-technological symbiosis, urban wastewater, the tick of children's bicycle wheels along riverside paths, the rustle of dragonfly wings, the drip of water into echoey aquifer. I'd like very much to tell you about a clear and certain future in this ever drier landscape one that we can net and identify as readily as a fish. Instead, I only have this, a glimpse out the window 
as our car returns toward Tucson from our Santa Cruz River survey. We are passing through the Tejano Adam Nation, a cross land that has been cultivated for over 4,000 years, the longest in our nation. Out the window, a stretch of wet riverbed glistens. Water snakes its way between rocks, cuts soft braids into the gravelly earth. It's not effluent, the ecologist tells me. It's not city water, not allocated flow pumped out of treatment centers. It just started bubbling up on its own one day. Groundwater rising where it hadn't risen in years. I turn in my seat to watch the silver blue of it. I can almost smell it. Minerals warming in the sun where they've been wetted, oxygen rising. Are there fish there? I ask. There will be soon, the ecologist imagines. Together, we look out the window and the river bends out of sight, a thin blue dream unspooling across the sleeping desert. Wow, I, um, as someone who's written a book about Western rivers, I'll admit I was a little bit jealous when I heard about this brilliant idea to write a book about uh, wastewater rivers. It's, um, it's such a common theme you come across all across the West. And I think it's um, amazing that you came up with such a good idea there. But after hearing you read, I'm no longer jealous because I'm um, know that it's in much better hands than I could have ever done <laughs> with uh, I'm just really blown away by um, all your descriptions and um, really looking forward to the audio book as well. So I'm um, really glad you joined us tonight and that uh, the Ellen Molloy Fund found such a uh, worthy recipient this year. We have a lot of questions coming in now. So, uh, Trent um, says Hans Christian Andersen once said there's a lot of uh, compliments in the in the feed as well, so I suggest you read those. Um, but I won't read all those out loud. But thanks for everyone who's sending those. Um, Hans Christian Andersen once said, "To move, to breathe, to fly, to float, to gain all while you while you give, to roam the roads of wild remote, to travel is life." Where else would you like to travel, and why? Oh, <laughs> that's the kind of question that I think. Um... <laughs> I need probably days to answer. Um, I, uh, for at least the last decade or so, have um, lived a pretty nomadic life working in, in really wild places. Um, and the problem with visiting beautiful places is that you fall in love with each one <laughs> um, and just kind of collect a list of loves that you want to return to time and again. And I think there's a lot of value to um, deepening roots in places that you know and want to know better. Uh, and, and also, especially as I uh, launch deeper into uh, this particular river exploration project, I think my appetite is, is whetted uh, for other wild river systems, especially. Um, more and more, I've, I've been exploring rivers in pack rafts uh, and little uh, inflatable boats that can be taken uh, to places that vehicles can't access. And um, in particular, uh, I would love to, to visit some of those river ecosystems that lie beyond deserts, um, but in other in the far latitudes. I think um, maybe my next explorations uh, when this book is finished will be to um, explore more of Alaska uh, and maybe uh, deep southern latitudes to um, Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego, <laughs> um, which have their own deserts, of course. Too. I could go on. There's a lot of the world that I still want to see. Uh, David Gessner would like to know who the heck Colin Malloy is. <laughs> I had to do a little sleuthing because it's not a last name you come across very often. And when I discovered that Ellen Malloy and Colin Malloy are relatives, I, I think, I believe, unless I did my research wrong, um, it was pretty thrilling in that they're both very different writers that have inspired me in different ways. But uh, Colin Malloy is a um, member of the, the band, The Decemberists. Um, and writes uh, extraordinary uh, lyrics <laughs> um, 
about uh, wild casts of characters and, and dark places, uh, and I believe is the nephew of Ellen Malloy, if I'm not mistaken. So a, a talented family that has certainly shaped my writing aesthetic in very different ways. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Decembris, great band for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, small, small world. <laughs> see a lot of okay, I don't see any other questions right there I'm gonna go into the other screen okay. um oh another compliment I'm from Tucson this is just so lovely to hear you write about my favorite place you're such a beautiful writer thank you for sharing with us oh gosh folks well <laughs> thank you um it's a total pleasure and honor to be doing this um even if only virtually. Uh, and I'm looking forward to folding um, some Utah rivers into, into these stories too. Uh, so hopefully I'll get to walk on the shores of the San Juan River sometime soon. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the, the listeners and, and the stage uh, for, for this reading. Um, and Zach, you're welcome to uh, come along on any of these river trips if you're feeling envious. <laughs> and, oh, you know, yeah. um. David Gessner wants to know which album to start with. And we also have a comment from Mark Malloy, who is Ellen Malloy's husband, who is the uncle, I believe, of Colin Malloy. So it's the other side of the, the family there. Um, so Mark Malloy is a, um, uh, lives in Bluff part of the year. I wish he was able to pop into his screen here, but he's just a listener here tonight. So he's, uh, he is confined to the chat space, uh, but he runs the Ellen Malloy Fund. He's a former river ranger on the San Juan River and a uh, character, of course, in all of Ellen Malloy's books. And um, he's got a very talented family that, yeah, does include Colin Malloy, the Decemberists. Um, and so, yeah, which al album would you recommend for people who are interested? Play. Uh, good question. I'm glad I did my research correctly. And I'm not uh, creating false families. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Gosh, you know, I think uh, the Decemberist album that I return to most often is The Crane Wife, um, which uh, also, I guess, uh, in, in many ways, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, has some similarities to my writing in that it traces mythologies um, and the story of The Crane Wife, um, if you're not familiar with it. Um, Maybe you can familiarize yourself by listening to the Decemberist version of it, but um, I think Castaways and Cutouts might have been my first um, experience with the Decemberists, um, older, deeper music, um, which could be a good place to start to if you want to be an originalist about things, which, gosh, I guess maybe most of us don't want to be these days. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, all the music is wonderful and um, a really lovely counterpoint to Ellen Malloy's essays and books, too. Um, well, grateful to be looped into that very talented family, um, even if just tangentially through this prize. <laughs> cool. Um, well, what people who are interested in uh, finding more Hannah Hindley, what, what should they do to follow you or to keep up to date with um, this book as it comes together? Uh, it is still very much a work in progress, so uh, folks might need to stay tuned for a little while here before um, it starts emerging, although I might um, be looking for places for some of the stories in it um, to find their way into print before, before it becomes a bigger book. Uh, but uh, you're always welcome to follow me on um, Twitter. Um, I'm at Hannah the Bold. Um, and I have a, a website as well, which I think is just hannahindley.com. I might be misstating that, um, but I'm findable out there and um, just published a little piece about salmon in terrain, um, which also has an audio version. So for all of those new fans out there who just <laughs> want more listening, um, you're welcome to tune into that also. Um, but yeah, grateful for um, kind words and, and for the platform and I'm honored, of course, to be reading alongside David Gessner. Um, so thanks to all. <laughs> well thanks again for joining us really looking forward to the book so yeah thank you <laughs> cool well, we'll hand it back over to uh aaron here who's got some closing comments for us but thanks everyone for sticking with us
Yeah, thank you so much, Zach, for moderating for us. Uh, Hannah and David, just absolutely wonderful. Uh, so thankful for your time and your talents this evening. Um, really loved your vivid, striking imagery, Hannah. And David, just a pleasure to get to know you better. As we are coming to a close this evening, um, wanted to thank you all for, for you know, joining us. Um, we hope you've enjoyed your time, the videos, uh, hearing from uh, David and Hannah. We wanted to encourage you to attend some or all of our remaining uh, events this weekend. As we said, you can go find those out on www.bluffartsfestival.org or on our Facebook. Um, to close this evening, I, uh, we have a final request for you, uh, for all of you at, at home and, and near and far. This is not just Bluff specific, um, although based on our participant list, we, we have a lot of folks from right there in Bluff, right here in Bluff, and we're just so thankful for you. So as Jim mentioned in his video, we understand if you aren't quite ready to share your 2020 story. However, we also know it can be cathartic to share and empathize with neighbors, friends, and family, and we'd really love to hear your personal stories. Our closing ceremony will take place at noon on Sunday, and we'll have special guests Amy Irvine and Pam Houston, um, who will uh, be reading for us as well to kind of kind of bookend our event. Um, but we'd really like to urge you to share your 2020 story with us uh, through a short story, a poem, or another medium. Um, please send your submissions to bluffartsfestival at gmail.com. I'll drop it here in the chat as well. And if you would like, we are happy to keep that anonymous. Uh, otherwise, please uh, make a note if you'd like us to share your name. We'd love to read some of these out loud. Um, and then if you're um, able to tune in, we, we'd love to have you. Uh, everyone here at the Bluff Arts Festival uh, is just so thankful everyone could join us this evening. Um, we wish you all well. Hope everyone is safe. And we hope to see you again very, very soon. Thank you all. Good night.